Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order on January 5th, 2015 at 7 o'clock p.m. And certainly want to welcome everyone who's here this evening and wish everyone a happy new year and hopefully I'll be off to a good start. Uh, if we could just take a moment for a silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Moffitt. And Councilmember Shul. We have two, three proclamations to present this evening. Uh, I don't know if Anyone's here uh, to represent Dr. John Hope Franklin, his family, anyone? If not, I, I won't read the proclamation. It's really in honor of Dr. John Hope Franklin's centennial birthday. As all of you know, most of you know, uh, he is deceased. Uh, we have a proclamation we're going to be presenting. Uh, they're doing a celebration of his life uh, later this year. And it speaks to the fact that he was born January 2nd, 1915. And Rentsville, Oklahoma, to attorney Buck Colbert Franklin and teacher and milliner pa Molly Parker Franklin. It speaks to the fact that he was awarded over 140 honorary degrees, lectured in universities around the world, was an avid orchid enthusiast, and had two hybrids named for him, was a marvelous chef, father, and husband, an inspiration to students and faculty. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have our honor the memory of Dr. John Hope Franklin's centennial birthday, and have I urge all the citizens to take special note of this observance and witness my hand in the seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina. This is the fifth day of January, 2015. And I know uh, I've spoken to his son, and someone will be here to pick this up. Is Dr. Wilson here? George, can you join me in your mind? Dr. Wilson is the professor of criminal justice at NCCU, and uh, we're here this evening to present a small proclamation uh, recognizing justice. Whereas the word justice appears in many of the United States' most cherished documents to include the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Pledge of Allegiance, whereas the pursuit of justice assures a fair society, whereas the North Carolina chapter of the National Association of Blacks in Criminal Justice in the National Alliance of Faith and Justice founded Justice Sunday to symbolically recognize Dr. King as a clergy and drum major for justice and to commemorate the spirit and selfish service of thousands of diverse volunteers who fought to preserve human dignity and achieve social change. Whereas the National Observance of Justice Sunday on January 18, 2015, and I might indicate that Justice Sunday is a trademark, offers a benchmark to launch and renew efforts to eradicate bias and divides, build mutual respect, and pledge to work together to ensure all children maximize access to the pencil, meaning education, rather than pen, meaning the penitentiary, whereas Congress in 1994 passed the King Holiday and Service Act, which directed the Corporation for National and Community Service to support a National Day of Service, whereas the theme of Justice Sunday, a charge to keep we have, service beyond and beyond, before and beyond, challenges all to facilitate assistance and transition and healing before and beyond the National Day of Service, whereas January is National Mentoring Month, during which NAFJ partners with institutions of faith, municipalities, and community stakeholders, the National Association of Blacks and Criminal Justice, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and others to encourage mentoring, whereas Justice Sunday 2015 will serve as a National Day of Recruitment for mentors to help youth to reach their full potential and 
whereas NAFJ encourages the use of National Park Service sites as resources to promote civic dialogue and interpretation of relevant themes such as civil rights. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby join with NAFJ and its local affiliate in proclaiming January 18th, 2015 as Justice Sunday, 2015, and urge all citizens to honor change through a broader commitment to volunteerism and service around pressing social issues. Witness my hand, Corporate Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the fifth day of January, and I'm going to present this to Dr. Wilson for any comments that he might have. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I only want to take a minute of your time. Just the sun, it was so many times we celebrate King's birthday, we forget the cause. And we take it as a vacation rather than a day to do any service. So Justice Sunday was used to commemorate Dr. King because most of the social movements in this country, especially civil rights, started in the church. And so what we're doing around Durham, and we've been sending letters in, around to different churches, asking them to take 15 or 20 minutes on Sunday the 18th to commemorate justice, unfairness in our communities, and to have a small dialogue and to have a prayer for justice in this country. So that's why we are celebrating Justice Sunday. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask uh, DeWarren Langley, Vice Chair of the Durham County Juvenile Prevention Council, and Larry Thomas, President of Thomas Leadership Mentoring Academy. Is Larry, oh, is it Larry? Uh, this proclamation is sort of in keeping with the one that I just read, and it speaks about mentoring. Whereas in 2002, the Harvard School of Public Health and Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, created National Mentoring Month, whereas the goals of National Mentoring Month are to raise awareness of mentoring, recruit individuals to mentor, and encourage organizations to engage and integrate quality and in mentoring into their efforts, whereas a mentor is a caring, consistent presence who devotes time to a young person to help that young person discover personal strength and achieve their potential through a structured and trusting relationship, whereas quality mentoring encourages positive choices, promotes self-esteem, supports academic achievement, and introduces young people to new ideas, whereas mentoring programs have shown to be effective in combating school violence and discipline problems, substance abuse and incar incarceration, and truancy, whereas mentors help young people set career goals and use their personal contacts to help young people meet industry professionals and find jobs, whereas youth development experts agree that mentoring is critical to the social, emotional, and cognitive development of youth, helping them to navigate the path to adulthood more successfully. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do by proclaim January 2015 as Mentoring Month in Durham, and here by called upon public officials, educators, business and community leaders, as well as encourage all citizens to observe this month with appropriate ceremonies, activities, and programs in order to, one, recognize the men and women who serve as staff and volunteers at quality mentoring programs who are helping our young people find inner strength and to reach their full potential, and two, to promote the creation and expansion of quality mentoring programs across the country to equip young people with tools needed to lead healthy and productive lives, and three, support initiatives to close the mentoring gap. Again, witness my hand, Corp. Seal of of Durham, North Carolina. This is the fifth day of January, 2015. I'm going to present this to Attorney Warren Langley and for any comments, and to the President also. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Before I get started, I would like to wish the mayor who celebrated his birthday on Saturday a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Mayor Bell. And to members of the city council and citizens of Durham, um, we would like to thank the council as well as the mayor for this proclamation. As having grown up in Durham, I'm a benefactor of mentoring and, and have benefited from individuals like Coral Cole McFadden, a former city council member Howard Clement, Michael Palmer, John Roars, and a lot of other individuals. We have a number of mentoring organizations here in Durham, such as the Thomas Leadership Mentoring Academy, Partners for Youth Opportunity, Movement of Youth, so many great organizations and individuals are committed to helping our young people grow and develop, and we just want to continue to encourage mentorship as well as allowing uh, young people to have opportunity to grow and develop in the city of Durham. And now I want to turn it over to Larry to see if he has any words. On behalf of uh, Thomas Mentor Leadership Academy, myself and our chairman, Larry Campbell, we would like to thank our mayor, 
all of our city leaders for their continued support um, because we all know the difference that a mentor, a pot, and the thing I like, always like to say, a positive mentor, because if we don't mentor them, they will be mentored. So we have to be positive mentoring. So once again, I'd like to thank all the mentors and everybody who's taking time out of their lives to mentor a young person. And lastly, you'll be hearing more from uh, my Brothers Keeper Summit for our young people here in Durham. So keep your ears open. Once again, Mayor, thank you so much. I'd like to recognize uh, any council persons with comments. I know Councilman Shule and then the mayor pro tem. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, we tonight on our consent agenda have a resolution concerning unaccompanied migrant children in Durham, which we are about to pass tonight, uh, where we make it clear that Durham is a city that welcomes all people, especially including unaccompanied migrant children who are coming to us from Central America, many of them from, uh, driven from very harsh conditions. They come here to Durham uh, and are, uh, they come here with a sponsor, and so they are here uh, with support from our community, but many of them need much more support. And I wanna, our resolution uh, thanks Durham Public Schools, uh, El Futuro, Immaculata and uh, El Centro and, and, and many of the other institutions which support these young people. And so uh, we're not going to be, I, I, I see Mr. Mayor that we have a lot of people here who came uh, to support this and we're not going to be discussing this tonight, we've already done it in a work session, but I wondered if those who were here uh, in support of this resolution concerning unaccompanied migrant children in Durham and welcoming those children would like to stand up uh, and, and uh, in their, with their support. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Sewell. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Um, good evening and Happy New Year, everyone. I'd like to uh, congratulate the Durham Ministerial Alliance um, for the Emancipation Proclamation Service on the first of January and for the citywide revival that it is sponsoring beginning tonight at Union Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, I believe in corporate prayer and to that end, I will be leaving this meeting somewhere around a quarter of eight so I can join the spiritual leaders of this city because if we ever needed prayer before in this city, we certainly need it now, so do I need an excused absence or to pray? Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to pray. <laughs> it's been proper to move and second by Councilman Davis uh, and Councilwoman Katati. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Are there any other comments by members of the council? I recognize Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thanks for all of you who are here. Um, I, I must say, the, uh, the gentleman pointed out a very good salient point, and that is <coughs> concerning uh, the mentors, that if we do not mentor our children, or if our parents do not, we know who will. And we know also the very negative, devastating effect if our children fall under the wrong mentors. So please, thanks for bringing that issue up. Also, I would like to make a point that we lost a very fine, dedicated 
public servant last week, and that was Governor Mario Cuomo of New York. Um, I went out to the Raleigh-Durham airport, oh gosh, this was probably 20 years ago, uh, to hear him speak. And it was quite an afternoon because he began his speech with a very simple question. And that is, what happens when a child, a student, drops out of high school? And then he, he then commenced to go through the litany of all the negatives, all the social ramifications, all of the community's negativity that would come from that. And again, that was a long time ago, folks, but I still remember it, and he will be missed. Thank you. Councilman Brown, are there any other comments, members of council? If not, we'll proceed with the agenda. I would ask the priorities items by the city manager, if there are any. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year as well. Agenda item number 23. Zoning map change auto park center Z 140011 uh, is an item that uh, is needing to be referred back to the administration to the city county planning department. Uh, the applicant's attorney and design consultant notified the city late this afternoon uh, of this request and uh, want an opportunity to uh, readdress a uh, site plan issue. So that will come back to council at a later date. Entertain a motion on the manager's prior times. Properly moved by the Mayor Pro Tem, second by Councilwoman Katati and Councilman Moffitt. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. I recognize the City Attorney for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, the City Clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. First being the consent agenda items. Consent agenda items may be approved by single motion. If a council member removes an item or someone in the public removes it, we'll discuss it later during the meeting. I'll read the heading. Uh, item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is the firefighters relief fund board of trustees appointments. Item three is the Raleigh Durham airport authority appointment. Item four is the passenger vehicle for hire commission appointments. Item five is street and infrastructure acceptances. Item six is a resolution concerning unaccompanied migrant children in Durham. Item seven is expedited hearing request for zoning map change Southside East phases two and three, Z1400034. Item eight is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item nine is a license agreement between the city of Durham and Brightfield Transportation Solutions to install a DC fast charger in parking lot 32. Item 10 is agreement for sidewalk construction on Avondale Drive, tip number U4726HM. Item 11 is a bid report from no November 2014. Item 14 is a change order to address modifications to the masonry scope of work for 400 Cleveland Street roof and envelope renovations contract with L.A. Downing and Sun Inc. Item 15 is a contract for property management services with GWC Properties, LLC, at 616 East Main Street, 101 South, South Elizabeth Street, 113 South Elizabeth Street, 601 East Ramsey Street, and 605 East Ramsey Street. Item 17 is in a local agreement with Durham County for the purchase of sodium chloride. Item 18 is U3308 Austin Avenue use and occupancy agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation. Item 19 is U-0071 Eastern Connector CSX Railroad Permit. Item 20 is SS4905 B1 Old Oxford Road at Danube Lane, North Carolina Department of Transportation Improvements. And items 22 to 23 items that can be found on the general business agenda. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda items. Second. It's been properly moved by the Mayor Pro Tem, second by Councilman Shul. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Move to item 8, 
general business agenda, 2015 long session legislative agenda to accept the proposed 2015 long session legislative agenda. Does anyone want to speak on that? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, city manager. Um, my name is Carmesha Wallace. I'm the senior assistant to the city manager. The item that is before you tonight is asking the council to adopt the 2015 long session legislative agenda. Uh, there were some questions that were raised during the city council work session. Uh, we do have, I think, a few folks uh, who have come this evening to respond to some of the uh, questions that have been raised by the council. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we have um, three people that have signed up to speak, and I will recognize them if they choose to speak. Uh, otherwise, we can have whatever discussion we need to have at the city council on this one. I think the issue has to do with the um, Schurz legislative proposal, and I saw Leo early when we came in. She's asleep and uh, Marsha Owen, is Marsha present? And George Wilson, is George still here? Okay, uh, so uh, maybe we should introduce what this is for the public, okay. the sheriff's report, our request. Okay, so the uh, sheriff submitted a request uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, and was subsequently forwarded to the council um, and what the sheriff is asking is for the council to support um, his proposal, um, and that proposal is increasing the penalty for offenses involving stolen, far, uh, stolen fire on, firearms. Um, I will say that uh, we were anticipating this item a little bit later on the agenda. I'm not sure if the sheriff is gonna be here. I did speak with someone from the sheriff's attorney's office, and I think they were anticipating being here um, this evening. But at this point, the only thing that the sheriff is asking is for the council um, to support. Uh, it is not the intent of the administration to um, advocate or lobby for this particular item or to work with the legislators uh, to draft language uh, to this effect, but the sheriff is simply uh, asking for the council to support this particular item regarding stolen firearm offenses. Recognize the mayor pro tem. So, Kamisha, did you say someone is, was to come tonight to is somebody here? I mean, from the sheriff's department. Yes, I did speak with, uh, I think, Curtis Massey from the uh, sheriff's attorney. Um, he and I spoke this afternoon, and he was planning to be here tonight. I must have thought it was going to be later. Yes. I certainly wouldn't want a discussion without them. Having well, I, I guess we, we, it's on the agenda, and we have persons that are here to speak on this item, so I'd like to recognize them at, at the appropriate time. Uh, Leo Rupert, uh, Marsha Owen, and George Wilson, if you care to come to the podium to the right. And if you could limit your comments initially to three minutes. Good evening. Uh, I'm Leo Rupert from the Carolina Justice Policy Center, and thank you so much for allowing me to speak this evening. My comments are a little bit longer than three minutes, so if just cut me off when you need to. And um, this is probably your first time here, in spite of Steve being around. But we we have, we have a, a clock over there that looks at the time uh, for the fall okay. of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to let you know that I value and respect the work of our sheriff, and I know that he has the very best of intentions regarding this proposal. And I too am concerned about the use of firearms in our city, as I know you are. Um, the question is not whether it's a good idea to reduce firearm theft. The question is whether the proposal would have the impact that you want. And the question is not whether or not we're just being tough on crime, but whether we're being smart on crime as well. So my request of you is that when it comes to increasing sentences, that you learn about the sentencing structure and consider proposals that become before you in a larger context, that you ask for evidence that lengthening sentences actually reduces the crime that you have in mind. 
and that you consider unintended and harmful impacts. We're not going to be able to go through all those in three minutes, but that's just a sort of general outline. Um, first, I hope you'll consider the larger context in which you're making the proposal here. I've distributed a copy of the North Carolina sentencing structure, and just briefly, this is how it looks. This is the larger context. The um, sentences go from most serious at level A to least serious at level one. And then they go uh, vertically. So level A, you've got murder. And um, I'm, not, I'm sorry, level A, you have murder. Level I, you have uh, a less serious offense, for example, criminal receipt of goods and services. Now, I just want to point out that all offenses are serious. There's not any offense that doesn't involve somebody or is not serious. Um, going across horizontally, you're looking at prior records. So if you have a very severe prior record, you would receive a, receive a longer sentence horizontally. So this is the context in which our sentencing structure is set. So when you raise or lower any penalty, not just this one, please think about the overall context. Because as you raise one sentence, you might be reducing this, the seriousness which, which another offense is viewed. The proposals before you um, in the context of, are in the context of North Carolina's sentencing structure. Proposal one increases the penalty for larceny of a firearm from a class H felony to a class E felony. The offense is at the H level because it involves a crime against property, which again is viewed as serious, but not as serious as a crime against persons. So by moving it up, you're equating it with assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious energy, in injury assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill, discharging certain barreled weapons or a firearm into occupied property. You would even be saying that theft of a firearm is as serious as an offense of that of a person who commits a lower level felony death by vehicle. So I have a few more remarks, but that's the general context in which I hope you'll consider these proposals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Marsha, thank you for this opportunity. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm Marsha Owen with the Religious Coalition for a Nonviolent Durham. And let me just fi finish what you began, if I may. That by, by having stolen firearms become, go from a misdemeanor to a felony at, the, at this class, you're talking about increasing punishment at 72 months. It would make it commiserate with assault with a deadly weapon, as Leo said, kidnapping in the second degree, um, and felony death by vehicle. I just don't think that that is commiserate. Um, I also think that we need to think thoroughly about how do we address stolen firearms and firearm thefts in Durham. If we're willing to spend 72 months incarcerating someone at the rate of $29,200, we're talking about over $175,000 for a firearm theft. Couldn't we be more creative to see how can we address this community so that people store their firearms more carefully so that they're not stolen and that we work as a community to address this in a more economic fashion and I think in a more just fashion so I would just like to agree with Leo that this is I think it is a extremely harsh response um, and not a very smart one thank you welcome uh, George Wilson I'm here representing uh, criminal justice politics center and uh, myself as a professor of criminal justice and increasing the sentences for gun theft, would that really reduce crimes? I'm not sure it would. I just finished reading and teach about a book called uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And this happened before. They increased the penalties for drugs. They made mandatory sentences for drugs. They misused the whole idea of why the drugs were there, gave misleading information, and it only caused mass incarceration rather than reducing the problem. I see the problem is that who's taking care of the guns, where are the guns stored, and what the citizens' responsibilities are for those guns. And I don't think that 
having an increase, we already have a penalty for guns. Increasing the penalty would only add to mass incarceration of those persons who are there. Citizens should be more aware of how they store uh, their guns, if they have them, which is their rights, and what they would do. But if I would look at the whole picture, increasing the penalty, but only increasing the number of people who are going into prison who will still be coming back out to our, to our communities, we can't serve the ones that are coming out now. And adding more people to, the, to our roles of our cities, of our jails, our social services, our housing, our jobs, would only uh, increase the problem increase the problem rather reduce it. So I am against the idea of adding additional time for a penalty that is already there. The problem should be how can you make folks take better care of restoring their arms rather than penalizing folks for sitting them. Thank you. Thank you. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, professor from Eagle Land. Uh, Wait, good evening. Question. Yes. So what do you suggest that we do? Now, this is my backdrop. Uh -huh. One of my church members was killed. Mm -hmm. He was lying in bed, and someone fired a gun, and I uh, penetrated the house, and he died. Mm -hmm. In my neighborhood, we hear gunshots all the time. Mm -hmm. On um, the day after, on November 30th, mm -hmm. uh, my neighbors told me, that they could not get into my neighborhood. And this is Old Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a uh, uh, shooting um, right on the periphery of our neighborhood in one of the apartment um, complexes. What do we do uh, for people who are getting guns, who are stealing them, but getting them from unknown places? What do we do? Just wait and let people continue to die, let us continue. You're the professor. Yeah. Please tell me. They're not getting them from unknown places. They're getting them from us. Why do we need them in the first place? We have too many guns in our society already. So why do we need more guns? They're selling guns. Now, I just went to a gun show, and they're selling yeah. guns that are fully automatic. It's, you can't do anything with them but kill people, and they have them stored in their houses, in their homes. So the idea is that why are people, there, are more, there have been more guns sold during Christmas than any other time. We're buying the guns, don't know how to use them, don't know how to store them, don't know how to lock them, uh, and so that's the problem. The issue is how would you trace the gun? My problem is that if it takes me three or four hundred dollars or four or five thousand dollars to trace the gun to find out where it came from and who stole it, it could be stolen, sold four or five times before they get it. So you really are not really helping the problem by increasing the penalties, you need to get rid of the gun, have some real, some real gun legislation to do something about solving the problem. To me, adding more time is a band-aid approach to solving a problem that's already here. The guns are already on the streets. Making a higher penalty is not going to take the guns off the street. And how can you definitely trace a gun back to say it's stolen? A lot of people don't, it, or you can have every citizen who has a gun <coughs> register the gun at the police station. Let everybody know where the gun is with their serial numbers and the gun, and they're not going to do that. So now you're going to find this gun that might be four or five years old, that might be transferred from, from family to family, from another state, and you're going to say, now this gun is stolen in, a, in an attempt. We need to have some real gun legislation rather than a band-aid approach to solving a problem that is out there in the streets already. I appreciate what you said. Thank you. I, I really appreciate what you said. Uh, but still, I have some concerns about what's already here, and we, we do a lot of studying. And while we're studying, people continue to get killed. But that's okay, that's fine. It's a part of the system, too. Thank well, you. Let, let me say something. I'm really disappointed that um, someone from the Sheriff's Department is not here to uh, defend the request that they're making. Uh, I, I have some serious concerns about uh, the use of firearms in this community. And I know that if we did legislation, it's highly unlikely it's going to be localized to Durham. Uh, if it gets to the General Assembly, it's probably going to be debated as whether you want to make it statewide, et cetera. I understand the mechanism, but at least you, you raised the question. L let, me, let me just share some information with, with my colleagues on the council. And we, we, we have a, uh, a group of people, uh, consists of the city manager, the county manager, the sheriff, the police chief, the DA's office, the uh, chief 
uh, magistrate, the uh, chief district court judge, superior court judge, and others. We meet once a month. Uh, and the focus is on violent crime in this community. And I don't have to say it for my colleagues, but uh, for the general public, when, when we speak about a violent crime, we're speaking about four different categories of crime. Uh, aggravated assaults, robberies, rapes, and homicides. The ultimate crime, as we probably all know, is homicides. But homicides are a very small percentage of violent crime in this community. Serious, but a very small amount. The highest amounts of violent crimes are aggravated assaults, robberies, followed by rapes and homicides. We, we look at this each month. We, we track it to see what the violent crime is in this community. And in 2014, from January 1 to the middle of December, there were 1,400 violent crimes committed in this community. 641 were committed with guns. When we look at aggravated assaults during a certain period of this time, I think it was from March, April, May, June, July, August, September, there were 1,036 aggravated assaults in, in this community. And a higher percentage of that was committed with guns. Same thing with robberies, all guns by and large. Now the question that I have is, I, I think that people at some point in time have got to take the consequences of their actions. I mean, when you break into someone's home, you're already beyond the pale when you've done that. Uh, when you're breaking someone's home and you steal something, you've still gone beyond. Uh, you've got a choice of what you want to steal. <laughs> now, if you want to steal a gun versus a television set or jewelry, et cetera, that's your choices you're making. But by and large, why are you stealing a gun? Are you stealing it because you're going to sell it to someone or you have intent of using it? Now, I don't know how many of these gun-involved crimes were from stolen weapons. We can find that out. But the fact is, they were committed with guns. And we've got to send a message that in Durham, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to do crime, period. But when you rise to the level that you're doing a crime and potentially hurting someone or harming someone with a gun, whether you intended to or not, we've got to send a message. Now, the question is, what harm is done when you put someone in prison for this for a longer period of time? My question is, at least they are off the streets. They're off the streets for four or five years. I mean, that might not be a good thing. And I know the analogy that George made with, with drug crimes, of, uh, the penalties with cocaine, et cetera. And I, I, I agree. I think we went far beyond. And we're finally coming back trying to correct that. But to me, guns are a different issue. I mean, you steal a gun for one or three persons. Either you're going to sell it to someone, you're going to use it, or maybe you're going to keep it as a trophy. Well, if you keep it as a trophy, you know, and you don't commit a crime with it, you're not going to get caught. And we're talking about people to get caught with stolen firearms. We're not talking about people to steal guns and we never know where they go. We're talking about those that have stolen a gun and they've committed a crime. That's, that's the issue. And I, I'm sympathetic to what the sheriff is, is requesting. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here. His representative is not here. And, uh, it's going to be hard to, to move this, I think, in the direction it needs to go. But I, I'm not under any illusions. Even if we supported this, it's going to be a tough battle over in the General Assembly. It's going to be a very tough battle. I'm not even sure that our local legislators would support it. But I think we need to raise the question, and we need to send a message that violence with guns is intolerable. Violence, period, is intolerable. But when you're doing it with guns, it makes it even worse. And when you're doing it for stolen firearm, that's a double piece that I, I think we, we, we need to deal with. So uh, I, I, uh, I, and I appreciate the comments that have been made. I, I know all the people, and I respect you very much for what you do. Uh, somehow, I think this has got to come back. Uh, maybe you can do both. Maybe you can study it <laughs> and try to implement it. But I, I just don't think we can leave it lying, uh, the, the amount of violence that we're seeing. And I'm concerned about Durham. I don't know what's happening across the state. I don't know if it's worse, less, or whatever. But I'm concerned about what's happening in Durham. It's intolerable to have this type of violence created in this community with 
the guns that are being done. And I don't even talk about homicides. I mean, I looked at homicides, and I think uh, the period of time that I looked at, we had, I don't know if I have the number here or not, uh, I think we had 12 homicides. And of those 12 homicides, all but three were committed with guns. <laughs> Again, gun involvement. Uh, and I got another speech I want to get on, and that's who's, who's committing these crimes. That's, that's a whole different story. I, I talked about that in Emancipation Proclamation, about who's really committing these aggravating. It's African Americans against African Americans, young people. <laughs> another issue we've got to deal with in this community. And, you know, maybe we'll start that with my brother's keeper, but uh, we, we have an issue here, and we just need to own up to it. And, you know, we keep studying it, but the facts are here. <laughs> We've got violent crime, and the vast majority of it is being created with guns. And the only question that I don't know, that I'm sure we can find out, is whether those guns were stolen or not. But having said that, is there any, anything else on this? Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Mayor, you know, first of all, I, I know that you have backed up your, uh, your, the wor your words uh, against gun violence uh, with many actions. You have been in the forefront of uh, really the kind of gun legislation that Dr. Williams was talking about, uh, Dr. Wilson was talking about earlier. You have been in the forefront of that, and uh, I know that you, uh, when it comes to this uh, gun violence, you put your money where your mouth is, and I, I appreciate it, and I'm totally supportive of that. Uh, and I agree with you about gun violence in our community and, and, the, and the ravage uh, that it causes, uh, and the havoc that it causes. Uh, but uh, you know, the reason that I don't support this, uh, our, th that the council support this, is that I don't think it's, it's going to, to do anything to improve that situation. Um, and I think it does have some some uh, negative consequences. And I do think it's important to think about, uh, let me just say that don't hold anything against Leo, the fact that she's married to me. Uh, she, uh, her credentials are, I will tell you her credentials, uh, one is that she's fabulous and she's brilliant and I love her. Uh, but the other credential that she has is that she, um, She's been on the, she, when the state legislature established the Sentencing Commission, uh, she was one of the first people to be appointed to that commission and has served on it for 17 years before she stepped down a couple years ago. The, the, the person in their state who served the longest on our Sentencing Commission and, and knows a lot about it. So um, I think that it's important to think about do we really want to support moving a crime against property into the same category of seriousness as a crime against a person? So stealing a firearm is, is terrible. And I agree with you. A lot of people want to wreak havoc with that firearm. But do we want to really make a theft of a firearm to be seen as serious as assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill, kidnapping, and assault on a law enforcement officer with a gun? Those are all crimes against persons. And, and we have a sentencing structure for a reason. And the second thing I would say is that uh, in the terms of the second proposal, uh, the sale or receipt of a stolen firearm is already a felony, not a misdemeanor, which is the second uh, proposal that the sheriff has. Uh, and I think that if we, we shouldn't be raising this, we should be, if we think that the, our district attorney is prosecuting this as a, as a misdemeanor rather than the felony it is, I think what we need to do is let's talk to our district attorney about prosecuting it uh, as it's supposed to be prosecuted uh, before kicking it up to a class E felony where it's as, extremely serious, uh, as serious as some of these crimes against persons. Um, and then increasing the term of imprisonment by 72 months, six years. Um, the, the state legislature just in 2013 enacted additional penalties similar to this for the use, not the theft or the sale, but the use of a firearm. Um, and so I think what we should find out is, has this had any effect? Uh, we should know that first, and uh, before we before we uh, support an increase here. And then finally, I just want to point out, and uh, it is terrible to break into someone's home and to steal a firearm. Those are, and those are both already crimes, and they're both already crimes that uh, carry significant punishment with them. And so, uh, for that reason, Mr. Mayor, um, I would hope that we would. Uh, 
uh, not support this as part of our legislative agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Shule. I just see that the sheriff and his council has come in. You've missed probably, uh, I don't know if you missed it or not, you may have seen it on TV, but Sheriff, I don't know, we're discussing your proposal, a request, and I don't know if you or your council wants to come forward. Good afternoon, or well, good evening. I hope everyone had a great holiday. Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, I appreciate your consideration for the legislative initiatives. I have forwarded to you and hope that you will support all of them. While I and my legal advisor are prepared to discuss all of them, I understand that the only questions you are concerned or the proposal is the increase to the penalties related to stolen firearms. This concerns the offenses of larceny, sell or receipt of stolen firearm from a Class H to a Class E felony, an increase in minimum sentences where another felony is committed with a stolen firearm. This proposal, proposal is based on my experience over the years of seeing so much gun violence in our community and seeing an increase in larceny in firearms, including gun safes. And I have heard a lot of discussion about the need to do something about the level of violence. Two years ago, Mayor Bell took a first step and proposed that the bail be set for persons who commit criminal acts with weapons be dramatically increased, particularly when they were a repeat offender. The council supported that proposal and it became law. So now, there is rebuttable presumption against releasing persons from pretrial confinement who are alleged to have committed previous firearms offenses. I see this proposal as a next step, enhancing the punishment of those who are convicted of offenses involving stolen firearms. And yes, I do believe stolen firearms are a separate and more significant threat to our community. I think it is fairly obvious that stolen firearms are not being added to someone's collection but instead are used in other crimes. This may be where it is used directly in armed robbery, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, or murder, or if it is merely carried by a criminal so they have a deadly weapon available for their use, or possessed by a felon who is not illegally allowed to own a firearm. I realize there has been some concern over the proposed increase and I do hope that the awareness of such significant penalty for stealing, selling, or receiving a stolen firearm will deter criminals. If that awareness does not, then perhaps their conviction and sentencing for those offenses will remove that particular threat from our community. Thank you, and I look forward to discussing any concerns you may have. Sure, if I, um, first I, wish you'd been here earlier to see, hear some of the comments that were raised in opposition to this. Uh, the net of what I'm hearing is that it's still too harsh of a penalty uh, for persons who commit the offenses that you uh, are, are proposing. And I don't know if you have any comments relative to that. Um, Mayor Bell the, and City Council, um, for the last two and a half years I have sat in meetings with the mayor, the police chief. I have watched the violence on TVs, on TV, and I feel that it's time for us to take an initiative or a step to try to cut or curtail some of the activity that's occurring in our community. Um, individuals who are committing crimes are not purchasing and they're not coming to the sheriff's office filling out the legal way to purchase a permit and to buy weapons. They are obtaining these weapons uh, from individuals uh, on the street. And I would hope that you would help support me in this matter. It's, it's interesting, people, people talk about- Could, could you identify you? I'm please. sorry, Curtis Massey, legal advisor to the sheriff's office. You know, it's interesting, people talk about equivalencies of what is this offense compared to other things? And the offense of larceny of a firearm is a class H felony, as is larceny of ginseng and pine straw. 
and I would suggest that this is a far more serious offense than either of those. And when you talk about Class C, yes, there are certain serious assaults upon person, but Class C felony also includes the unlawful possession and use of an unmanned aircraft, a drone with a weapon. A Class E felony also includes possession with intent to sell controlled substances within a thousand feet of a schoolyard. So it's not simply the serious physical, but other hazards that are included within the Class E penalty. So you may say that is this a overly serious classification, but how serious is the threat? And that's why the sheriff, when we pulled this out some months ago and started looking at making that change, came to that level of class E. Now, it's also been suggested, and we were here for some of the comments, that there was a statute passed last year regarding enhanced sentencing when a firearm is used in the commission of a felony. And that's true. Interestingly, that only applies if the use of the firearm doesn't have to be proved as part of the underlying felony, i.e. armed robbery, it would not apply. Assault with a deadly weapon, it would not apply because use of the weapon is part of the underlying offense. Here, it is simply saying the use of the stolen firearm is an additional kicker, regardless. It would still be necessary to show that the firearm was stolen and it was known to be stolen. But it's about elevating the punishments for that larceny and use of the stolen firearm. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. Um, first, I just I want to say that I, I believe it's an unintentional mischaracterization to talk about concerns about it being too harsh. What I've heard are concerns about effectiveness. I don't think this is an issue where we disagree on being tough on crime. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, have you all consulted the North Carolina Sentencing Commission on this? I mean, that's that's the standard. That's the body that, that um, considers. And they would be part of the process, but right. no, they've not, it's okay. not been submitted to them. At this the time. second is do you have a projection on reduction in gun thefts and gun related crimes? What do you, what do you expect, other than, I mean, do you have any kind of a. I can tell you uh, for this year or for the past year, we've seen an, up, an uptick in break ins in the residences. And in those break-ins, uh, we've had firearms stolen, but we all ha also have had firearm safes taken out of the house. So uh, we've seen uh, an increase of uh, 30 to 40 percent in our break-ins in the past year. The, um, are, are most of the firearm larcenies that you're seeing safes that are removed from the house? No. Um, we, we had a speaker earlier, um, the mayor pro tem asked, well, what do you do if you don't do what you're recommending? And the uh, speaker who's a professor at NCCU suggested that improper storage of a firearm might merit consideration. Would you all support legislation uh, penalizing people for improper storage of a firearm? In other words, a theft is both the person committing the theft and the opportunity for that theft. Well, most homes and that are broken into, uh, Councilman Moffitt, the homes are ransacked. Uh, people don't just errantly lay their weapons out around their homes. They're, they're put up. Uh, they're, they may be in gun cabinets. Uh, and citizens are actually buying gun safes now. So, you know, at what point or where do we start an initiative to try to curtail and stop? Um, you know, I've lived in Durham all my life, um, and I, I am proud of where I live. But I am committed, not only with the programs I've started at the Sheriff's Office, whether it's the, the educational program, 
to uh, allow young people to get their education, or the Choices program that we started for 11 to 16 year old who are at risk youth. I'm committed to trying to make a difference in our community. And, you know, if someone is incarcerated, at least their family can go speak with them. They can't do that if they're buried in a graveyard. Well, I don't think any of us would um, disagree with that. Um, and certainly none of us are soft on crime. None of us want to see more gun crime in Durham. But, the, the, but the, I think the considerations raised are simply about, um, and I understand the sense of, I want to do something. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, let's do something. And um, certainly there are parts of this community that are, I don't think it would be too far from the mark to say under siege. Um, well, I, I believe that when things happen here in, in Durham, uh, you turn to Chief Lopez and the police department and then turn to the sheriff's office to say, what can we do? And so I, I'm trying to make a step. I'm trying to make a, a step. I'm tired of talk, sitting at a table and talking about it. I'm trying to help do something about it. Thank you. Well, I recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess my, my question on number three here, when you talk about uh, how the minimum term of imprisonment for any offense with the underlying felony was committed with a stolen firearm will be for 72 months, six years. Uh, and does that matter who stole the weapon? I mean, if the person is committing the felony with a stolen weapon that was not stolen by that person, uh, does the discretion of a judge get removed because of this automatic minimum term of imprisonment? Um, and, and, and it doesn't, doesn't seem to matter as long as it is a felony, and I'm not talking about death, but it, any felony that is committed with a stolen weapon, would the person gets an automatic six-year sentence? Well, the minimum, uh, yes, sir. Um, first, it would still be an obligation to establish they knew it was a stolen weapon. So that first question you said, would it matter if they knew? Yes. No, no, would it matter oh, if that person stole the weapon or if someone else stole it? No, as long, if they received the weapon knowing it was stolen, there would still be the additional enhancement. And then, you know, it's interesting, this goes back, Councilman Shule was pointing out about there's already been an enhanced punishment for offenses committed with a weapon. This is the exact same enhancement. It just extends it to stolen weapons. Um, as far as the discretion, that's going to really lie more with the issue of the district attorney and how he chooses to prosecute. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, you have a comment? Okay, I have a comment too, but I'll, wait to you. I'll defer to you. <laughs> I'm, I usually don't. I'm, uh, well, let, let, let me do this, Steve yeah. Benson. Uh, the mayor pro tem has to leave, and sure. Councilman Brown hasn't spoken. Yeah. Okay. I, I need to know if we're going to vote on this, because if we are, I need to stay here. I hate to forego the opportunity to pray, but I'll stay for this one. We're going to vote on this tonight? Well, it depends. On, I have a suggestion how we might move with this, okay. but I'll, I'll wait right. till oh. we've heard people speaking. Go ahead. Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'm glad. <clears throat> excuse me, to have uh, representatives of the Sheriff's Department. I would suggest it would have also been beneficial to have someone from the Durham Police Department here uh, this evening. But I'm, I'm going to ask you, Sheriff, I guess you've talked with uh, Chief Lopez about this. And yes, sir. Uh I sent the proposal, the document, over to Chief Lopez probably in about a month and a half ago. Okay, so he is, he's a supporter of this? As far as I know, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I, uh, <laughs> I was struck by uh, some comments 
from the earlier speakers that uh, perhaps the focus should be on uh, storing, <coughs> excuse me, storing arms versus stealing arms. And I'm a little puzzled by that um, because the uh, it is as the mayor pointed out and others it is a conscious act not only to break into a home and to steal items but to steal a gun and I do not believe that the burden of proof should rest with a homeowner on this because as you have pointed out as well Quite often, uh, the, the places where guns are stored, or the entire box uh, is stolen. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, you can buy these at Costco, mm -hmm. gun storage places. Um, and so even with those who decide to store their, their guns in these cases, gun cases, quite often their guns are stolen as well. Uh, secondly, I concur with uh, Professor Dr. Wilson in, in terms of the drug laws and, and what we did in the past and how many of us now will agree that has been a failure. Um, but I think it is not exactly a fair comparison to make when one talks about the harsh drug laws versus gun laws. Uh, and as the mayor points out as well, some of these laws are, are being rescinded or pushed back into a more commonsensical approach. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, our entire criminal justice system is under attack. Uh, this state ranks number two in the nation. That is to say, second from the bottom in terms of what we spend on this system. And it has moved beyond embarrassment to what is now a full crisis situation. To such that perhaps even in April, we may not even be able to pay in North Carolina those who serve on juries, the $15 or whatever per day that they receive. We, we can't afford to do autopsies on some of those who are killed perhaps in, in criminal cases. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. Um, and I also believe that, uh, and I, I really want to applaud what you did in terms of uh, inculcating more education into the jail. And the crime cabinet would be, we're gonna to be touring our mm -hmm. county jail uh, this Friday. Yes, sir. Uh, because, Jails in this country have become places where when the inmate leaves, he or she is a more hardened criminal than perhaps when they first entered. Uh, but all of this aside, uh, I'm certainly inclined to, to go with the mayor and the mayor pro tem on this. Uh, is it a perfect response? No, but uh, perhaps this will send a message uh, to those to at least think twice before they steal uh, a gun. And we are talking, ladies and gentlemen, about 1.4 million guns that were stolen in the past six years in this country. Uh, so let's hope this will send a message 
to those who are inclined to do so. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I usually don't like to talk twice on these things, but y'all weren't here when I got going, so forgive me. Yes, uh, and uh, uh, Sheriff, has been said a couple times here, I know that your intentions here are absolutely the best, and I have no quarrel with that. I know that we're on the same side on that. I know that your intentions are pure, and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't agree that this will work, but I know that you bring it forward with the idea that it will, and I totally trust and believe that. Um, I just do want to point out a couple of things. And the, in terms of, I, I thought that uh, my colleague Eddie Davis raised a really important point uh, where, when he asked about judicial discretion. And, uh, and I understand that the DAs have some discretion about uh, what, what they charge people with. But I think it is clear that, we, we ought to be clear that this is a mandatory minimum. Uh, this is, this is not, does not give the kind of judicial discretion uh, that we are moving back towards in this country. And um, the, uh, we know that the, uh, the California three strikes and you're out law uh, has been, uh, is, is being uh, dismantled. We know that um, the federal government uh, with Attorney General Holder's support and leadership has been lessening a lot of the mandatory minimums uh, that have been pr imposed for uh, for drug crimes. And so I think that to impose a mandatory minimum on this situation is moving against the kind of judicial discretion that the, that the country is, is moving towards. Uh, and I think rightly so. Um, the other thing I want to say is I, I totally believe you again that the, you've seen an uptick in the, in, the, uh, in, this, in the theft of firearms. I completely trust you on that. And, but I think that one of the important things when you think about crime data is not just an uptick, but what, what's the trend? And um, we, we, my, my colleagues, we have in front of us on the second page of this packet the, the trend in firearms stolen during household burglaries uh, from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And you'll see that if you look at the left-hand column on the second page that the thefts, victimizations involving firearm theft nationally have fallen from 300,000 in 1994 to about uh, 150,000 in 2010. Uh, there was an uptick in 2009. There have been upticks in other years, but the general trend has been down. And this is not to say that's not still a serious problem. It is a still serious problem. Uh, but I, I think that when we look at crime data, it's good to, uh, to think about it in the, in the big picture. So those are my additional comments, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it, and uh, thank you very much. Let, let me, uh, since we've had, had this discussion, process-wise, you're at, uh, Kamisha said this was support. Can you, can you explain? I know the difference, but for the record. Uh, uh, for the record, the sheriff has asked that we, uh, he, so, he solicited the council support for this legislative initiative, which uh, the sheriff is, will be advancing independently and separate you know, from, from the council. Sheriff, sure, have you had any conversations with any of our legislators on this issue? No, I haven't. Okay. I'd like to move this to our legislative breakfast to have a discussion with our legislators and see where they are on this because somebody's going to have, have, have to take the bill forward. I mean, we can talk about it all day long, but if nobody's interested in taking it forward, it's, it's not going anywhere. Uh, if there's no support for our legislators to do this, uh, then, at least from this viewpoint, it looks like it will be dead. That's why I ask that you contact anyone else other than our local legislature. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about harshness. Any particular reason why it was raised from an H to an E and nothing in between in terms of the suggested penalties? We, we have, uh, Legal Advisor and I have been going, um, mm -hmm. I've been discussing this with him for over a year. Um, and in the meetings back and forth uh, with our meetings monthly here, um, there was something that I felt that it needed more uh, precedence on, on the seriousness of a weapon being used. And I'm just gonna use this analogy. We all sit behind computers every day and we mash a send button. You can recall that message. 
somebody pulls a trigger, you can't recall that bullet. So uh, that's a serious crime. Anytime somebody wants to intimidate someone with a weapon, or they actually use a weapon. And uh, I'm, whatever's going on around the country, I'm in tune with. But I care about the community I live in and the people I serve. Well, I, I'd like to move it forward. Uh, I'd like to get a little bit more information as to why we went to E rather than anything in between in terms of harshness. And understand that if someone does something with a gun, there could be other charges other than just the fact they stole a gun. I mean, it's aggravated assault, you kill someone, you aim someone, that, that's, that's going to be a part of it. Uh, the other piece, Mr. Manager, I like to get, I like to get information from the police department, looking at the robberies and aggravated assaults that occurred in our community with guns, is there any way they can tell us how many of those were done with stolen guns? Uh, I think that's additional information I think would be helpful uh, as we move forward. But I, I'd like to move this to our legislative breakfast and have that discussion with, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to recognize you, Councilman Shuler. <laughs> need a motion to do that, Mr. Well, I, that, that's a suggestion, but I'm, I'm going to recognize Councilman Shuler. That's all right. I, I, I'd like to. I'd just like to vote it up or down. I don't, you know, if I'm on the losing end of it, I'm okay. Uh, but but I'd, I'd just prefer to go ahead and uh, uh, vote it up or down. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, entertain a motion on the item. The motion move. is support. The I move support. Second. It's been proper moving second. Sure. Question back. Clarify that this motion is about the entire uh, a, the entire legislative right. package, not just specifically this item, or is it? Or are you talking about just well uh, detaching this item from no, the legislative no, agenda no, and voting on that separately? No. Well, he, he has other proposals on there, but I guess I was uh, focusing on the stolen firearms. Right, I'm talking about, but the the agenda item itself is our entire legislative package, of which this is an advocacy request. Okay. So I didn't know if you wanted to. Um, I still move the entire the the the, 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 the oh, uh, you, oh you're talking about the whole package no I, I'm, I'm sorry uh, so I don't know if you yeah there, there are two different motions I think that we're talking about Steve if the motion is that's for the whole package and that's right. that's a different issue I was trying to isolate this this portion of the agenda uh, I thought that's what the motion was going to be well in reference to let, let me clarify. just tell you yeah. what the motion is the motion is for this item that the chair is here speaking I move that we it become a part of our legislative package. It's been properly moved and second by the Mayor Pro Tem, Councilman Brown. Any further discussion tonight? If not, I'm going to call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We'll close the vote. The motion fails for a lack of seven three yeses and four noes, so someone is not voting in the affirmative. Is Councilmember Brown, are you voting yes? Okay. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Mark. I, I just wanted to briefly say, you said earlier that you're, you want to do something. I know you work hard every day on behalf of the citizens of Durham, and I just want to appreciate everything that you do to make our community safer. Thank you for all of that work and for the energy that you're putting into these proposals tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. We're going to move to the next item, which is Mr. Mayor. Your legislative agenda. All right, yes. so just with that item removed. Right. Yeah. I'll move the, the rest of the legislative agenda. Second. It's been proper move and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote and close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you. Move to the general business agenda, public hearings, assessment and improvements, item 22, public hearing, to consider resolution to rescind 11 previously ordered petition sidewalks. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, <clears throat> Cole McFadden, members of council. I'm Marvin Williams, Director of Public Works for the City of Durham. Item 22 is an, is an item to hold a public hearing to rescind 11 previously ordered petition sidewalk projects. At the September 4th, 2014 work session, an, an item was brought forward regarding the pri prioritization of sidewalk construction, including 11 projects on this item. 
And after much discussion, council expressed a desire to amend the assessment rate for these petition projects from $5 per front foot to $35 per front foot. In order to do this, the council must first rescind the existing order projects prior to reissuing new petitions at the higher rate for those that they desire. <clears throat> this item is for the initial rescission of these projects. All other actions, for example, issuing new petitions, ordering projects at the higher rate, will occur in the future as separate actions. All property owners, petition sponsors, and applicable homeowners associations have been notified of this public hearing via U.S. mail. Letters were mailed on December 19, 2014. In addition, an ad announcing this public hearing was in the December 22nd edition of the Durham Herald Sun newspaper. Staff recommends that council act on the recension of these projects, and we are here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. This is a public hearing matter. You've heard the staff report. Uh, the public hearing is open. I would ask first other questions, comments by members of the staff or the members of the council. If not, I'm going to recognize persons that have uh, signed up to speak on this item. And when I call your name, if you come to the podium to the right, uh, each of you has three minutes. Uh, Bill Mitchell. Bill, you signed, you had two cards I'm here. Wallace Lamb. Is Wallace Lamb present? Uh, Jesse, is that Basil? Yeah, thank you. Rhonda Silver, is Rhonda Silver present? And Maria Oyaski. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Uh, this is a public hearing that has not signed up to speak. If not, Mr. Mitchell, you can proceed. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bell and the City Council for the opportunity to speak on the issue of the petition sidewalks. I'm specifically going to be addressing the Grandale and Sidwick Road projects which are items number seven and 11 on the project list. I am the president of the Parkwood Association. I'm here to representing the 1,006 homes in Parkwood and the 1,000 or so homes in the surrounding communities that will be affected if the sidewalks are canceled. The ad is the vote is rescinded. Um, we request that the council not rescind these sidewalk projects, but rather build on the work that's already been done and open discussions with the affected um, groups to see if we can find ways to get some or portions of these sidewalks at least built uh, and re find ways to reduce the total costs of doing it. A lot has changed since some of these sidewalks were approved back in 2006 and 2008. Um, Hundreds of volunteer hours were spent just on the two sidewalks, which I'm going to discuss, the Grand Ellen Sedwick Road sidewalks. And besides meeting the intent of the walks plan, these sidewalk projects were also meant to meet the safety and connectivity objectives of the plan. So we did a lot of work to make these viable projects. And we'd like to see them at least considered. Um, concerning the safety, Objectives, the motor vehicle tra traffic and the pedestrian traffic on Sedwick Road has increased substantially since the City Council directed construction of the sidewalk six years ago. Sedwick is now a popular east-west cut-through and is projected to become even more so as congestion on Highway 54 and development along Grandale Scott King Road, Highway 54 and 751 South increase. The west of Sedwick Road is particularly hazardous for pedestrians because it forces them to walk along the edge of a busy, uncurbed two-way street. Concerning the, the connectivity objectives, on the pass out which I gave, on the back side there is a map that shows how these sidewalks will connect with existing sidewalks. Yes, the two sidewalks uh, scored low on the list when the city consultant applied the 2011 revised scoring criteria. But as shown by the following examples, we question whether the projects were scored properly. The Sedwick Road project goes by a city, uh, by a park. It's not a city park, so it did not get scored positive for that reason. The Sedwick Road sidewalk also connects the sidewalk directly to one that goes to the Parkwood Elementary School, but it also did not get credit because it doesn't go in front of the school. And as showed in my handout, again, the sidewalks complete a network of existing sidewalks, but they did not get but partial credit for that. 
So we like to re-discuss these issues with the city. Um, rather than resume them. That's all, thank you. Uh, Wallace Lamb. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for your time tonight. Uh, I appreciate you uh, hearing me out, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, city councilman and women. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your hard work and your effort throughout my city. I'm very appreciative, and uh, I thank you for uh, your service. Uh, I didn't know how, many, how often I'd be able to uh, address that, but I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, ev everything you've been able to do, do for my town and the efforts. And uh, it definitely shows uh, every day, I feel like we're getting better and better, and we're progressing uh, you know, each and every day. Uh, the whole thing about it is um, uh, towards this, uh, for uh, Eno Trace, that's, that's uh, basically uh, uh, what I'm here for, and you know, to, to talk about the actual uh, uh, sidewalk, and the, the you'll have to bear with me right now because uh, my handwriting's not so good, and uh, basically uh, I hurt my arm because I don't have uh, very good uh, sidewalks to walk on. So I mean, I mean, <laughs> I actually broke my arm a couple of months ago, so I can't write very well, and my notes aren't that good, but. Uh, uh, if you could bear with me, uh, the whole thing about it is that uh, not for only safety and exercise for my community. Uh, a big standpoint is uh, the security for the neighborhood. Now, in the neighborhood of Inner Trace, I don't know how familiar you are, it's a horseshoe neighborhood, and uh, with the actual um, sidewalk that goes through Shade Brush all the way to uh, Lazy River, that would make a complete loop, and uh, with that, I uh, thoroughly believe that uh, that would entice more uh, homeowners to come out of their homes and actually be a part of uh, walking around the neighborhood and being more of a watchful uh, eye on security. And uh, since I've actually been in Eno Trace, uh, I've, I've lived there since 2000, and I, I've seen, uh, uh, unfortunately, hate crimes gangs, uh, people in cars doing drugs, drug houses. And uh, it's very important. Uh, it, we, we've actually spent a lot of effort trying to work with uh, the local authorities to, uh, to keep our community uh, upstanding and uh, do what we can. But I mean, one of the things about it is that uh, I feel that the security is uh, in question because it, it, it really helps to get people out of their houses and be a part, you know. It would, now with today's technology, cell phones, you know, we're able to do the 911, be able to uh, get somebody to the scene, and having somebody that's able to walk around the neighborhood, be proud of their neighborhood, they're able to uh, get uh, officers on the scene by seeing a visual uh, uh, quick as possible. So I mean, uh, just if you could, just think about that and I would appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Jesse. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Bell and council men and women. Um, I am also representing Eno Trace, as, as Walter was. And I would like to, um, to talk about the, the sidewalks on uh, the issue of safety, as well as, um, of course, improving the vibrancy and the walkability and the health of the neighborhood. And um, particularly with safety, this sidewalk in between uh, uh, sh uh, Shade Bush and uh, Lazy River Drive, the south side of Infinity, connects two parts of the road that are in between two big hills. So it's really, you, if you're heading, um, <clears throat> if you're heading either east or west, you, you can't see very well, and the the road slopes uh, uh, away, and there's no shoulder. So there's really nowhere to walk. And I can attest to the hazards where actually Wally broke his arm while walking that stretch of the road. I mean, this, is, this isn't a, a, a safe place to walk. And me and my wife, we're, we're avid runners. We have a small child that we often have in a, in a jogging stroller, and we can only run about a mile within the neighborhood before we have to cross Infinity Road, and there's a blind hill. The speed limit's 45 miles an hour. People often go much faster before we can get to other neighborhoods where we can run farther. The addition of the sidewalk would add a considerable amount to the walkability of the neighborhood. And um, that's all I have. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Rhonda Silva. 
Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I would like to see the sidewalk in my neighborhood rescinded. I don't know about the situation and the others. I'm on Green Street, we're talking about one block, we're talking about the size side of the street. From my perspective, I didn't sign the original petition, although I've lived there for 15 years. Um, I think that it's aesthetically nicer without the sidewalk. I am concerned about my tree, which is quite large and quite close to the sidewalk. And I'm concerned about my privacy um, because on my side, um, the houses are closer to the street and that brings people from the street closer in to me, which I would prefer not to have. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name's Maria Oyaski. I'm the petition owner for the petition on 1000 Block of Green Street. But uh, although it's a fantastic block and it needs a, a sidewalk for a million reasons, including that we're close to the Durham Public School Elementary School, George Watts, uh, we're a missing link in a connector between the LAB Creek Greenway and uh, Watts Street, which is a major corridor. It's well lit. People traffic at, at night a lot. But I don't have time to talk about how wonderful my block is. I would like to talk about my concern about how it seems that there has been a false choice raised up to say that these neighborhood-initiated sidewalk petitions need to be rescinded in order to allow the, the top-down rather than bottom-up vision of where sidewalks need to go. Um, I want to thank Nathan McHenry and Dale McKeel for having dredged up a lot of data for me on very short notice. Um, and I just, I assume, I hope <laughs> that you're aware of these numbers, but I think it's important to put the numbers into context of how much money we're talking about if, because I think that most people who live in a city want to have sidewalks. I think it's an important thing that distinguishes being in a city from being in a rural area, um, is the ability to walk safely uh, which is everybody has pointed out is good for one's health and so forth, but the ability to walk safely without being run over by cars. Um, so I don't think anybody's in, most, most people are not in dispute that they, they want to have sidewalks or not. The question is how much money or is it reasonable to put into it? And so as I understand it, the Durham strategic plan says there are five things that the city ought to be doing. We should focus on a strong and diverse economy, safe and secure community, community thriving livable neighborhoods, well-managed city, effective stewards of the city's physical assets. These are the goals of the city plan. And the sidewalks actually play into all of these. And yet, as I see it, from the numbers I'm aware of, the budget doesn't seem to really be taking the, putting uh, sidewalks very Im as very important. Um, the current population of the city of Durham is 242,000 people, 242,810 people, total city budget of 390 million. The to city sidewalks budget, however, is 200,000 for this coming year. That is, by my math, if all my numbers are correct, 0.5% of the total city budget so f is, is going to sidewalks. And the per capita budget for sidewalks, therefore, is we're spending 82 cents per person on sidewalks, new sidewalks, and repaired sidewalks? Is that actually the amount that we're putting in? Um, now, the Durham Sidewalks Plan, it's a fabulous comprehensive plan. It takes all kinds of great things into consideration. But as I understand it, the latest estimate of how much it would take, not, not even to implement the whole plan, because nobody seems to know what that number is, but to implement the 24 listed projects would be $14 million. Now, at the current rate of funding, which is $100,000 per year, that would take 140 years to implement this plan. Now, 140 years ago, Durham was not a city. What do we plan to be 14, 140 years from now? If we're serious about implementing this plan, if we're serious about sidewalks, the funding for the sidewalks needs to increase dramatically, and there shouldn't be this choice between the city plan and the neighborhood petitions. Thank you. I, I, I'm not being facetious when I ask this question, but you signed up as a proponent for us to rescind. I didn't know what the text of the resolution was. Okay. I apologize. So I'm in opposition to the resolution to rescind. Okay, thank you. I, I was, I was concerned All right, thank you. Me. Let me ask the other persons that want to speak on this item. It's been a public hearing matter. If not, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring the matter back before the council for a discussion or action. Ask Councilwoman Katati. 
Yeah, I, um, I have a lot of comments. First, I appreciate everybody that's called, written, and certainly all of you that have come out and sat here with us this evening. Um, I think we desperately need additional money for sidewalks. I've been saying that for a very long time. Um, we have dedicated very little money over time. Um, I do expect that we'll have additional conversations in upcoming budget hearings, but um, I do see this particular vote this evening as a way to at least prioritize what we currently are doing and this is the first step and then we'll reevaluate based on that. We were given, oh I don't know, 12 to 14 choices of next steps that we would do with this. But um, I think to proceed with sun sidewalks that independent of a priority plan, which is our Durham Walks plan, is not the best use of very limited funds. Um, I was encouraged to try to explain the process, but I almost think that I should defer to staff about what the options are. But can you, um, well, I, I don't know. I just, uh, again, really want to reiterate that I appreciate everyone's comments, but we do need a lot more funding. And um, I, I would prefer to see us do it in, through the Durham Walks plan where you can really see what our highest priority projects are that will meet, reach the most people and address the highest safety concerns and proximity to schools and a whole host of other things. So I'll stop for now. Were you deferring to the staff? Could I, could I walk the staff through a couple sure. of questions? Sir? Marvin, Marvin could, could you uh, talk just a bit about uh, currently, just in general, I know everything's a little bit different, what, what's the average cost per linear foot of, uh, of sidewalk and uh, to install a sidewalk? Approximately. Um, right, right now we're currently averaging approximately fifty-five dollars per foot, but it varies. Right, I understand. Depending on location. Fifty-five. So under the the uh, current petition policy, uh, not, not not these sidewalks, but new new petitions coming forward, that petition would require the petitioners to pay what per linear foot? The thirty-five dollars per foot if they were in the Durham Walks plan, and if they were not, it would be the actual full construction right. cost. So uh, how many of these sidewalks, regardless of ranking, are in the, the, the uh, Durham Walks plan? Do we know? Five. Five. Five, five so, sidewalks. I, mean, I don't know if any of the, do you know specifically which five? Just, I don't believe we have them separated out. I'm just trying to clarify. For example, is Sedwick Road or, or Grandale, are those sidewalks in the Durham Walks plan? Grandale is Sedwick Road. Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Uh, I'll read the uh, sidewalks that are in the Durham Walks plan. Uh, South Roxborough Street, Green Street, Sedgwick, University Drive, and Grandin. Okay, so j just to clarify the process going forward, if the council acted tonight to rescind the petitions that have already been put forth, there would be a new opportunity for new petitions to come forth from these communities and other communities. For those sidewalks that, that came forth that are in the current Durham Walks plan, the uh, participation from the petitioners would be at $35 per linear foot? That is correct, sir. And for those sidewalks that are petitioned that are not within the Durham Walks plan, those would be at, we'll just use round terms, $55, but it could vary depending full cost. on for the full cost going forward. So I just want to be clear about that. Council members, is that everybody's understanding? And then at what point do you anticipate that we would uh, uh, potentially be revisiting the prioritization of the Durham Walks plan? We, we would really have to defer to the transportation department since they took the lead on that effort. Um, if anybody from transportation wants to uh, address that. Mark Aronson, transportation. That's something that we intend to bring up to the budget process this year. Right. Is updating the Durham Walks plan. 
Thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Manager. Was there other comments? Councilman Shul, Councilman Market. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just want to say that for everybody who's here today to talk about their sidewalks and the and the need that we have, we totally agree with you. The 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 uh, when I one of the first meetings I ever had with the city manager, one of the things he talked to me about was how far Durham is behind on sidewalks when I first got elected. And there's no question that's true. And the stories that, uh, like the gentleman about the jogging, I have had so many people from so many neighborhoods tell me something quite similar to that. And I know you're right. Uh, and so, you know, I think that one of the things, it's incumbent on, on us, I think, to try to figure out how to how to make this uh, not the false choice that, that uh, our final speaker uh, talked about. I think that that's something we've got to do, and, and we need to be thinking about how we're going to get the level of sidewalk uh, construction that we need in Durham. Uh, what I will say about it is it's expensive. Uh, if I do the math, I th it's $55 a square foot, about $250,000 of, uh, how, how much is that for a mile of sidewalk? Marvin, can you do the math for me? Not off the top of my head. I'm about a quarter of a million dollars, I believe, of uh, per mile of new sidewalk, and I believe it costs about a hundred thousand dollars to repair a mile of sidewalk. I could be wrong on those figures, but worth thinking about. So, w if we do this, what it's going to mean is taxpayers are going to have to pay for it. And so, for those of you all who are in a situation where you feel it's very important for us to get more sidewalks in Durham, which I agree with. You're going to have to convince your uh, w your fellow uh, your residents of Durham that it, that it's worth paying for because it's really expensive, um, and so I think it's something we need to figure out how to do, uh, and uh, I hope that we can, um, but that doesn't solve you know your problem in the short term with this uh, with this process. But I, I do want to say that in the big picture, uh, it's it's I completely agree. It's we're not where we need to be, and we need to change it. Thank you. That's Councilman Moffitt. When this first came up, I put myself in the position of uh, petitioners, and I thought, I, I can't, I could never support this because we, we told people, if you go out and you do these signatures, then someday we'll build a sidewalk. But I realized that some of these projects have been on here for seven years, eight years, and that um, the likelihood of them getting funded it's misleading to continue to leave them on the list because they're probably not going to get funded. So I, that's the conundrum I find myself in here. Um, I do want to uh, just read to the record. I don't need to read the email, but we received an email on January 3rd from Deidre Murphy uh, regarding the university drive sidewalk, and she was also opposed to recension. I just wanted to, since she couldn't be here tonight, put that into the record. Any other comments? I recognize Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thanks for all of you uh, who came out tonight. I want to uh, go back to the Parkwood, and I'd like Mr. Williams, if he can, uh, because I think you, you brought out two points concerning the uh, uh, the Cedric Road sidewalk and that it was one reason it did not receive as higher or as high of a score as you had hoped and anticipated was that uh, the park that's in front of the sidewalk, proposed sidewalk, was not a city park. And secondly, that, correct me if I'm wrong on this, or maybe it was Eno Trace, no, I think it was Parkwood. Oh, okay. Uh, and then secondly, no, no, no. But the sidewalk going to the Parkwood Elementary no, didn't go all the way to the school or something. And, and that gave it a, a another reason for a negative reading. Am I correct? Did I hear that correctly? Can someone explain that to us and to Mr. Williams? Yeah, step up to the mic, please, sir. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Brown. The park is one of our Parkwood's largest park. It's publicly available. We don't restrict access to it. 
The sidewalk, though, is not a city park, and because it was not a city park, he got zero for a score because the consultant, as we understand it, was told to have it go by parks, and he assumed city parks. And the Sedwick sidewalk itself connects directly to the Revere Road sidewalk, which goes directly by the school. But because Sedwick proposed sidewalk does not go by the school, it also didn't get any score. That's why we think that we didn't get a fair uh, evaluation on scoring. Okay, I would suggest, uh, Mr. Williams, that regardless of what the outside consultants tell us, that this is the sort of thing that we need to be very cognizant of. Uh, I'd rather rely on neighborhoods here in the city than some consultant about this, but this needs to be corrected. Now, let me continue because I, I'm on record as saying that unfortunately Durham is sidewalk poor. Uh, and I'll be the first to admit that I should have taken a stronger stand when we passed several years ago, $20 million street improvement bond, which the citizens supported. But we should have set aside a percentage of that for sidewalks. Uh, and we did not do that. Uh, you know, we speak often of connectivity, and that's usually meant to be between various neighborhoods. But what we fail to discuss is connectivity within the neighborhood itself. And how do you do that? You do it primarily with sidewalks. And I'm, I'm very sorry you broke your arm. Uh, I, I'm confused. You broke your arm. <laughs> uh, because perhaps of a sidewalk that was not there. Uh, but anyway, we, um, as others have said, we're definitely going to address this in the, in the next budget hearings that will start, Mr. Manager, in January or February? The budget. Yeah. The budget hearings will begin in May. The budget process I mean, begins today. The process. Today. <laughs> well, the process. And uh, we need you, your support uh, to help correct what has not been done in the past. Thank you. Comments, council members on this item? If not, the public hearing has been closed. We heard the remarks, entertain a motion on the item. Uh, we have four recommendations from the staff relative to this. So when I say recommendations, options that we could take. So if uh, you're making a motion, it would be good to frame it in terms of the staff recommendations, possibilities, actions we might take. So page two of the staff memo, the alternatives. Those are alternatives. And the recommendation, uh, Mr. Mayor, just for the record, is to uh, rescind the uh, previously ordered sidewalks. And then we would initiate the process anew. I I'm waiting, in, I'm entertaining a motion. Does anyone want to make a motion on this item? Is there a second to that? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? Hearing and call the question. Madam Clerk, be open the vote. And close the vote. It passes five to one with council member Brown voting no. Okay, thank you. We're gonna to move to item twenty three, zoning map change, auto park center, Z fourteen zero 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 one. Oh, you didn't hear the motion? Okay. The, the motion is to rescind the sidewalks that we have. Correct. Yes. Wait a minute, let me go back. To, I've gotten off of my motion. Okay. 
The maker of the motion was Councilwoman Katari, so I'm going to defer to her as to what her motion was. Um, right. The um, recommendation from by staff was to rescind with no alternatives. So my question would be for the manager or for staff to please clarify um, when it will come back to us with all the different options, because again, there were several. So I expect that now that we've taken this first step, we'll take additional action in the future. Is that correct? Or that's, that's correct. We'll work with the city manager's office to identify <clears throat> which of the alternatives will best be suited during the budget process. And you'll see this again at some point when we talk about the... Um, well, let, 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 let's do this. Let, 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 me, let me read what the alternatives were for the record. Since it's actually, I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to explain the motion and also let you know what the alternatives were that the staff was recommending that we consider, since you don't have it before you. You do? Okay. We didn't vote on either one of those alternatives as where it stated. It was to rescind the petition. On, on page two yeah. of the memo, there's a thing that says recommendation. And immediately under the word recommendation, it says that the Public Works Department recommends City Council conduct a public hearing to receive comments and adopt a resolution rescinding the following previously ordered sidewalks and then list the 11 sidewalks. That was the motion that Councilwoman Katati made. It's on page one. So Sorry. Effective, effectively, we approved the staff's recommendation to rescind. We did not recommend one of the alternatives. We'll be considering many of those in the future, Correct. sometime between now and June. Correct. Correct. All clear? Okay. And by the way, I live in the neighborhood, so I appreciate it. I didn't want to get on the bandwagon to talk about sidewalks. I appreciate the need for sidewalks, and we're going to try to work to see what we can do to make those things happen. And the vote was already been taken, and it was Councilman Brown was the one that voted against it. Everybody voted in support of it. Okay? Yeah, I was getting ready to say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, item 23 was the one that was referred back to the staff by the city manager's priority items. Let me ask, are there any other items to come before the council this time? If not, the meeting's adjourned at 8.47 p.m. Thank you.